Today we're really looking at test well sites that have been evaluated recently as well as a larger benefits analysis that you've heard about in the past. We've just expanded that a bit for this presentation. Um, but the important part I want to bring to your attention is what we're seeking from you, and that's some input and guidance on the selection of test well sites so that we can better understand the capacity of the boulder zone below those specific locations, so that we can move forward with maybe a larger program later, and we select sites that we are confident in the boulder zone's capacity below those specific locations. So the importance of the test well is not necessarily to understand the technology of wells. We understand and we know that wells work. We just heard that there's deep wells being installed all over the region, uh, specifically for wastewater in some cases. We're looking at stormwater. Uh, but that we understand what that boulder zone's capacity is below a specific location. So keep that in mind, please. All right, so October 2017, we received a direction from the governing board to work uh, a plan up to validate some initial benefits analysis that was performed. You probably remember Cal up here presenting that information to you. In March 2018, we then presented a phased work plan that identified an approach to get us through a test well phase and then possibly into a full, impl full implementation of emergency estuary protection wells. And since then, staff has been performing additional modeling to continue to analyze benefits and take on additional SERP implementation strategies into those benefits, benefits analysis. We've performed, performed site evaluations, and we're designing well specifications and drawings that will be suitable for test well permitting and construction. So phase one of that work plan was a two-year approach. The first year, we said we we're going to continue analyzing benefits of those wells. Uh, that is ongoing, but today we're going to present where we are within that analysis. Perform site evaluations. That's complete of multiple sites. You've seen the green dots on the map. We're going to see them again today. Uh, test well site selection is in process. That's what we're here to really talk to you today about. Uh, permitting is pending. It's really dependent upon the location that's selected for the test wells. Uh, we're performing geophysical study to understand on a more um, high-tech way, a sonar basis, to understand what does the subsurface look like at different locations, and then developing design standards. Again, that's in process, and really to complete that, we need to understand the location that's best and most suitable for where we want to go with this program. And then at some point, we'll start our groundwater modeling. So we have not begun that, but that is pending. But I want to address your attention to the picture on this slide. Um, you saw a little different version of that in Mark's presentation, but this is the substrata below our surface here in South Florida. The blue, the dark blue at the top here, is a surficial aquifer layer where many people get their drinking water. Below that in teal, about a thousand feet below, is where we drop our ASR wells to. This is the Floridan aquifer. And then further down here in the pink is the boulder zone. This is where our test wells will go. This is where we're going to seek to understand capacity at different locations. The very top back on the top layer is the Okeechobee Utility Authority. And we bring that to your attention because the Okeechobee Utility Authority already has a well. Uh, currently it's being used for wastewater disposal. Um, but it's a place that we understand what the boulder zone looks like, specifically in that location. Uh, and to demonstrate that, we've got a really neat video. If I can make it play. There it goes. So what we're looking at is the boulder zone, getting into it. The numbers at the top is the count, the depth. So we're around 2,780 feet here. Notice the rock formations on the side, mostly limestone, very porous layers. Um, and as we get deeper into this video, we start to see greater expanse and opportunity, volume, capacity to place uh, the water that we'd be looking to put down a well like this. Again, this is the Okeechobee Utility Authority's well. They were nice enough to allow us to do this. We get deeper and deeper. It's very clear down there, as you can see. And that all of those cavities are places that water will continue to reach as you continue to put water down the well. And again, as we get closer and closer to 3,000 feet, it starts to open up a bit. It 
So this this is I call it deep inner space, <laughs> but this is uh, what the bottom or near the boulder zone looks like. Most people haven't been this far. <laughs> so I'll let it finish up. We're almost there. Very clear. I think it goes to about 2900 and stops. You can see the, the rock formation changes a little bit. Hansley, is there a casing above this? Is there? Yes, there is. When you drill the wells, there is casing. Down to how many thousands of feet? It varies until you've hit a, a stability layer, basically, where you can be confident that you're not going to have a pressure issue and caving in, or you're not going to um, keep your water from being able to go where it needs to go. So it, it's, it varies. I'm just thinking about for contamination reasons. Okay. So is this the, casing going to be down 2,500 feet? It or could be. It could be. It could be. So what we know, what we do though, what, we're, what we uh, can install and, and will likely is a monitoring well. Now typically not necessary for an exploratory well, uh, but a monitoring well typically goes in when we're installing for a full-time facility. This is going to be maybe an eight-day test for the test well to understand just again, what is the capacity? Is this a great place to do this or is it not? Um, when you put the monitoring well in and you start to think about movement of water, I'm, I'm sure you're probably thinking up, the monitoring well sits as a neighbor well and it's able to see how water moves, whether the pressures are, are changing, whether water is moving up, down, are we seeing um, transmissivity in the wrong direction? Um, and when we hit a certain level, you cut off use. The monitoring well tells us Water's moving in the wrong direction. It's time to stop using your, your deep well. So you, you put that well in with the monitoring capability at levels lower than where you would see the Floridan aquifer, perhaps, so that you don't ever reach the Floridan. But with this particular well, yes, do sir. you know if there's a casing in it? There is a casing in this one. And yes, sir. you don't know how deep? I don't know how deep this just one is. Me that. I'm check. just curious. You can certainly check. Uh, I'm, I'm very curious because that's... That's an amazing structure that we're looking at with no casing. At that depth. But above there, there is definitely casing. Okay. Yes. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. You're welcome. Sure. Um, okay. Are you, is that it for the presentation, ma'am? No. I guess that's what I thought. But <laughs> you do have something immediately. <laughs> but there's a test at say. the end, I promise. Great so video. Great take video. Take your pencils out. I'm an I, engineer. We like math. I, I would just ask very quickly, what's the diameter of that shaft? This one is a 24 inch well. So, okay, oops, let's go back. All right, so we talked about siting evaluation. Uh, what did we look, look at at our site evaluations? Well, number one, is the property district land? Do we already own the property? Is it accessible for well construction? We just talked about these casings. There's going to be large trucks that come in with very large casings on them. We have to be able to pull that tractor trailer in, put those casings down, turn that truck around, and get it out to redeliver. So we have to have the room to bring all that material in, the drill rig that's got to come in, and then all the room to actually, once we remove what's inside, once we drill out everything, we have to have a place to put it. So we need the space on the site. Is it accessible and is there site geometry to accommodate all of that? Is there power availability? Is it single phase or is it three phase? Three phase is preferable. Are we at a source water location that's desirable? Again, site geometry. We talked about having to construct the well, but once we identify that the boulder zone is a great space, maybe we want, to want, we want to put clusters of wells there. Is it a large enough site to put a cluster of wells? Uh, potential biological issues, threatened endangered species, wetland impacts. We evaluated these things. Is there an existing monitoring well on site? If there is, that's great. Uh, potential impacts to waters of the U.S. or the core civil works activities. If we're impacting these things. We have to go through a 404 approval process or a 408 approval process, which adds time to the process. So we had all these green dots that we looked at, and uh, we 
went out and evaluated every single one of them. We had a team of folks who went out in a van and they spent two days looking at all those site criteria and trying to figure out what are the most favorable sites. And what we really came down to um, is they're all quite good, but some floated to the top. Those four are Taylor Creek at the L63N Canal, ASR, there's already a well there. We understand some of the subsurface. Kissimmee River ASR, again, already a well there. However, it's sitting within the footprint of the Herbert Hoover Dyke. It's going to need a 408. It's going to take a little bit of time. Boma, out here on the C43. Great site, large site, plenty of accessibility. We don't know a whole lot about the geology below the subsurface here. Test well would be very important here. Spoil management site, again, large site, great site. Uh, won't need any 408 approvals, but again, we don't have a well here, so a test well is super valuable. Just briefly over each of the sites, specifically the Taylor Creek site, great accessibility, three-phase power, geometry is great, no 408 requirement, has an existing monitoring well, has lots of gopher tortoises, which we can handle because we have a lot of experts that here in-house who are trained, um, they're wildlife specialists who know how to move these gopher tortoises. We have a specific site the district just completed that uh, is permitted to take these gopher, gopher tortoises. So we can handle that problem, but there are a bunch of them. Um, the only other challenge here is that the source water is upstream of Lake Okeechobee, so it's not directly connected to the lake. Kissimmee River ASR, we talked briefly that it's in the Herbert Hoover footprint, so it's going to take a little bit of time to get through that. However, it's a great site, directly connected to the lake. It's got a well, uh, three-phase power, good geometry. Boma, again off the C43, we've got moderate biolo biological issues potentially, uh, something we can work through, but um, so not a showstopper, very accessible, lots of area, three-phase power, and uh, has the capability of collecting not just Lake Okeechobee discharges, but possibly basin runoff. We haven't completed that part of our benefits analysis, uh, but could be a possible uh, plus for this site. And again, similar plus for the spoil management site, can capture the Lake Okeechobee discharge, possibly some basin runoff. Very accessible, very large site. We could put lots of wells here if the Boulder Zone agrees. Okay, so we just talked about what we did in phase one, year one. Phase one, year two, would be to pursue the test well, to procure it, construct it, install it, complete the design, submit any permits that might be necessary, and hopefully come back to you in December with a, with a request to approve a contract to build one of these wells. And then we'll also procure some construction management services to oversee the installation. This is a 24-hour, seven-day-a-week operation to put one of these in. Um, so we want to be sure we have a, uh, someone who is specialized in this kind of activity, likely a hydrogeologist, much like our, my friend Bob here, um, to be sure that what's being done is done in accordance with the specifications and the requirements of installing one of these wells. Okay, so I mentioned earlier the geophysical study, the super high-tech sonar activity that could be done. And I really mean that's kind of what it is. It's, it's like taking a sonar of the subsurface. They run a vehicle across the surface, it takes some deep pictures, and it spits out a port, uh, profile such as this, which kind of gives us an idea of what the boulder zone looks like. Uh, what is interesting is we, we saw the video of the boulder zone at Oak, Oak Utility Authority, which is here on this red dot, by pursuing a study like this at Okeechobee, we could pair up the uh, portfolio or the profile with the actual um, capacity that we see at Okeechobee and maybe see if we can find matches at some of these other locations and give us more confidence in that boulder zone at those different locations if we see aligned profiles and test well results. Right now we have a contract we're getting ready to release that will have four of these studies uh, to be completed. Again, one of these is Okeechobee Utility Authority. Where we do the other three, we kind of want to hear back from you on what you think is important in terms of the test well sites. So what are the next steps? Again, looking for your input on site preferences. Uh, we need to complete our design, design for the test well once we identify that site. We're going to submit a permit application for that selected location. Solicit a project for bid, conduct geophysical evaluations that we just talked about. Continue our benefits analysis, which I'm going to talk about here in a minute. 
and then hopefully again bring back to you in December um, a request to move forward with a contract to enter into an agreement with for a test well. Okay, so I'm going to step to the side a little bit with this Okeechobee Utility Authority slide. I've talked about it, but I think you ought to understand what it is. Uh, it's a high capacity well. It's largely unused. It was designed for a greater uh, capacity than what they're actually using it for. They're right now they're using it around two or three million gallons a day for wastewater. It's a simple design, but so are most wells. <coughs> Uh, it's not yet proven at 15 million gallons a day, and it's in close proximity to the L63N canal. So again, not directly connected to the lake, but very close. Uh, it provides us an opportunity for partnership. If we wanted to pursue testing at this location, we could ask them to proceed with a 15 million gallon a day test, which is our target goal, 15 million gallons a day per well. They would then submit a plan to DEP to re-rate that well to 15 million gallons a day if it were successful. And we could compensate them for this activity to help us understand, again, is a boulder zone uh, that we saw capable of handling the 15 million gallons a day that we want to look at? OK, so the benefits analysis. So we're going to broaden our scope a little bit, talk very uh, closely in with test well location specific, but now let's look at wells as they compare to uh, the implementation of our SERP program. So our goals, the goals of the analysis, quantify benefits of the range of wells as CERT projects are implemented, provide information to determine what's the robust number of wells to construct. Where do we think is too few and where do we think is enough? What was the methodology? We use the RSM basin model, which is one of the tools that we have here at the district we use for other things for CERT related simulations. We can, that we can inject the excess LACO discharge up to the capacity of the number of wells we determine we want to place into the simulation. We can quantify the resulting lake triggered estuary high discharge events, which are defined by, which I think is super important because this is the same definition we use for SERP high discharge events. When flows are greater than 2800 CFS at S79 or flows are greater than 2000 CFS to the St. Lucie estuary. And we looked at analysis of up to 100 wells, which each, with each of those performing at 15 million gallons a day, just to provide us kind of an understanding of what does the end look like. But I think the two most important bullets on this slide that we also considered are, number one, we know SERP's important. We know SERP provides restoration benefits that are greater than just providing estuary protection. Um, so we are ensuring that we're running this with the thought that these are going to work in conjunction with those restoration components. They will not replace them. And that these wells will only operate as an alternative tool to reduce damaging discharges to the estuary. Okay, so before we get into the, the fun part, uh, there's three colors on here. The dark, bolded black is the model line you're going to see uh, in addition with a blue line for SEP. The black line being the existing condition baseline. That's today without any other SERP implementation. SEP, when SEP comes online, is the blue line. And SEP plus is the red line you'll see with SEP, the EA reservoir, and LOPE. So remember these three things. There's a test. <laughs> OK. Now we get into the fun part. There's these three curves here. We talked about the black line, existing condition baseline, SEP, the blue line, and then SEP plus, the red line. Before we move too much further, I want to walk you through the y-axis here, which tells us the number of LACO triggered high discharge months. So this is in terms of months. The x-axis, the top line, is the number of wells, 15 million gallons a day, again, our target for each well. The total of the capacity of those wells, based off of where you're looking, for instance, the bottom of the x-axis, for instance, four wells will give us about 93 CFS. Okay, so if we have no wells, none at all, today, existing condition baseline, in a 1965 to 2005 period of record, that's 40 years, we have 70 months of high discharge. If we were to have SEP, no wells, we'd have 44 months of high discharge. If we throw in SEP plus, no wells, 17 months of high discharge over 40 years. 
Okay, next step. If we decide we want to install 30 wells at the existing condition baseline, no, set, no sir, we have reduced the high discharge months to 54 months. At 30 wells with SEP, we've reduced the high discharge months to 35. With 30 wells, and we introduce SEP plus, the number of discharge high discharge months goes to 15. So what it appears, though, is that the value per well might be decreasing, perhaps. Again, this is only based off of late triggered high discharge events. If we were to consider basin flow and basin runoff, the value of each of these wells, if they could capture basin flow, would probably be greater. So, but keep in mind, let's talk about the range of it. This is right now looking at about 30 wells, right? If we were to take those curves and find where they start to flatten out, where do the wells start to become equivalents for us? Or where do they really meet their max capacity, their max value for us? Where those curves flatten out looks like it's about 60. So 30 to 60 wells we think is probably a truly effective range when you're using a model simulation of just lake triggered high discharge months. But what's super important as well, again there's a test at the end I promise, we never, depending on, here's your 100 wells we talked about, we never get to zero high discharge months, depending on, it doesn't matter how many wells we put, there's always going to be a, an amount of flow that exists that we just can't capture even with wells. Okay, look at it slightly different. So we're going to look at the reduction in months with 30 wells, different view, same information. The reduction and the existing condition baseline is we reduce by 16 months with 30 wells. 35 well reduction, 35 month reduction with 30 wells with SEP. And 55 month reduction with SEP plus and 30 wells. Okay. All right, slightly different view again. Same curves, existing condition baseline, SEP. SEP plus with eight wells on the existing condition baseline, we go from 70 months of high discharge to 63. If we keep those eight wells and then, I'm sorry, if we move to 20 wells, we install 20 wells and stay on the existing condition baseline, we go from 63 months of discharge, high discharge events to 59 months of high discharge events. If we then implement SEP, we still have our 20 wells we go from 59 months of high discharge events to 36. We add, make it 33 wells instead of the 20. Those high discharge months go from 36 to 32. You then implement SEP plus and you get discharge months go from 32 to 15. So these are, I'll go back. These are pretty impactful. What we know is estuaries derive benefit from these wells under any SERP condition. We know that we can't capture everything despite the number of wells we may put in. Um, we know that we have some future analysis we want to continue to work on for basin runoff to understand how wells would impact um, the basin runoff and lake triggered events. There's no obvious breakpoint. We looked at the curves. Where did they start to flatten out? We said 30 to 60 looks like a pretty good range. And of course, there's always other factors that we have to consider when we determine how to proceed. And that could be cost. It could be construction scheduling. It could be where do we sit within the CERT program. Uh, so these are all factors that we have to consider as we move forward. So the test is coming. A couple more slides. Hang with me. Very important, we know it doesn't eliminate LACO discharges. We know and we agree that all of these are very important in making sure that LACO discharges uh, can be reduced and that restoration continues because those are important portions of our program. Uh, but we know the wells can be tremendous. So here comes your test. If in September of 2018, we saw nine days of pulse releases averaging 1170 CFS, which is actually a true number. If we saw that, which we did, 
how many of these days of pulse average or average pulse releases would go away with 60 wells? Remember, they're 15 million gallons a day. The answer. They all go away. So with 60 wells, Lake Oco, Lake Oco releases could have been diverted to the wells instead of going to the estuary. Okay, so now that you all passed the test, we have to come back to our test well locations because I need your input and I would love your feedback to understand what locations do you believe are most important for us moving forward with test wells. Again, these were the most favorable sites of all the green dots. Taylor Creek, Kissimmee River ASR, Boma, spoil management. This captures the pros and challenges that I ran through briefly. Um, staff, having looked at these, really has two that we believe are uh, probably the most favorable of the most favorable. Um, so I'm going to leave this up here, allow you all to take a look, peruse, and um, ask any questions you may have.